we are going to be talking all about indoor plumbing, sanitation, how we get clean water, and that all-important question of where does our poop go? How does indoor plumbing work and why is it so important? There's some cool history lessons that we'll be talking about as well. Well, I know that it's really important because I don't want it here. <laughs> no. Nope. I want to flush that stuff down and have it gone. And then in our math lesson, we're going to be talking about... Modeling. Modeling, making models and how we interpret data. Hello to King Husky from Nebraska, to Molly, to Owen, to Carrie, to Ash from New York, to Cervanti from Maryland, to Fluffy Plays from the Netherlands, Sarah and Josh and Layla. We're so happy to have you here watching us live and a special welcome to you if you are joining us for the replay. Now to start out with, because I know and you have probably noticed, people can be a little funny when it comes to poop. So <clears throat> this is something that we, we all do, everybody poops, but we kind of have an interesting relationship with this topic. And the, there are words for poop that are bad words that are considered offensive in every single language. And some of this stems from the fact that this, although the poop emoji is quite cute, poop can make you sick because it contains a lot of bacteria. And so it's kind of a natural thing that we have an aversion to it. Now I'm gonna say in the chat, especially the chat on YouTube, go ahead and just get the poop emojis out of your system, put some poop emojis in the chat, and then our moderators are going to sort of crack down where, where we don't want the whole chat to be full of poop emojis the whole entire time. So right now's your chance, get them out of your system, and then no more poop emojis so that we can talk about how interesting and important this topic is. Man, I've got to... <clears throat> Got to say, I don't know if I can handle this topic. I'm not not mature enough. You, math Dad, you can do it. If if Math Dad can be mature enough to handle this topic, then you can too. <laughs> and let's start. Let's start by talking about septic systems, because this is something that a lot of people will have. When you flush the toilet, there are pipes that take all the water and the waste that just were put in the toilet, and they take it down. And in a lot of cases, it goes into a septic system. And I'm curious. So that's just a tank in the ground, right? It is just a tank in the ground. And it's kind of similar to a porta potty. So I bet most of the people watching, most of us have used a porta potty at some point or another. Or if you've gone camping and there's been a pit toilet, you have used a pit toilet. And this, the way that they work is really pretty similar. Everything goes down into a tank. And if it's a porta potty, that tank is just a simple tank. It might have some chemicals in it to try and kind of reduce the smell, but really it's just water, a tank of water, everything goes into it. And then when it gets full, you better pump it out. Otherwise your pit toilet or your porta potty overflows and it's no longer usable. It's completely full. A septic tank is a little bit different. And when we look at how a septic tank works, it sort of gives us a preview of the whole entire idea behind modern plumbing systems. So in a septic tank, the waste goes in, but then you have a pipe that is going out and the pipe that is going out is just for the water. You don't want the waste, the actual solid part, we call that sludge. So the sludge is gonna settle to the bottom, all the solids are, and that you actually have to have pumped out every couple of years. And if you are, if you're watching in the chat right now and you have a septic system, I'm curious, just say if you know, how many years can you go before it has to be pumped out? It all depends on how much you're using it. My parents have a septic system and they go between five to eight years between getting it pumped out because with two of them, there's not a whole lot of waste going into it and they can go that long before they need to pump it out. My sister also has a septic system. She has seven kids and with nine people living in her house, her septic system needs to be pumped out about every three years because there is more waste going into it. Now you pump out the sludge every three to eight years. And I'm kind of curious to see in the chat if people know how many years they go. Um, I'm seeing several people like saying, yeah, Peg has a septic system three to five years. And um, Alicia, her grandpa actually pumps septic tanks. That's his job. So this is kind of cool. Several people know that they have septic systems and I'm sure that there are some people watching, some kids who are like, I have no idea if we have a septic system or not. Where does it go? Well, you'll find out soon. Wait, wait, okay. So what if you didn't pump it? 
if you did not pump it, then eventually you would go to flush your toilet and nothing, it, nothing would go down because your septic system would be full and all of that sludge that had filled up the tank would start to back up into the house, which would be really stinky and smelly. And you wouldn't let that happen for too long before you would be calling the, you know, you'd be calling the pumper and saying, come get our, fix our septic tank quick. The reason why septic tanks can go that long, because that's a lot longer than a pit toilet or a porta potty, is because most of the waste that we put down our toilets, most of it's water. And the septic system has a pipe that goes out from the tank for the water to go into. And the water waste goes into that pipe and then there are a lot of small holes that come out of the pipe and it drains out into the ground. Now there are certain rules about where you can have a septic tank and where you can't. Because if these pipes are letting it out and it's right next to a river, then you're actually gonna be putting sewage right into the river. And that would be a very bad idea. So it has to be a certain distance from rivers and waterways. You need to have gravel around it to help kind of filter some of that material as it's coming out. But in this little cartoon that I drew right here, you can see that one of the flowers says, is it just me or is the grass greener on the other side? And then the other flowers say, it actually is greener here. And I wanna ask Math Dad, little pop quiz Math Dad, do you know why grass would be greener over top of a septic tank? And this is, this is a legitimate thing. Grass could be greener over the top of a septic tank. Okay, um, because the plants like the nitrogen that's coming from the poop. Is that, that's it, right? Nitrogen is a valuable nutrient for plants, right? And you may have, so that that, that is part of it, but we're going to get just a little bit deeper in a minute. Because well, I used to work on my, my grandpa's farm growing up, and we had this manure spreader. So we'd clean out the barn, push it all out with the tractor into this manure pit. And then we'd back the manure spreader down the barn and fill it up and we'd take it and we'd actually spread it out on the fields. Yeah, so, yeah, not, so not the most glamorous job, but, but kind of cool. No, yeah, a smelly job, but really important. If you're a farmer and you have a bunch of cows, you know that the manure that your cows make, all that cow poop is actually really valuable fertilizer. You can use it to fertilize your crops and the plants will grow better because of the nitrogen the potassium and the phosphorus. Those three elements, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, those are the ingredients in fertilizers that you buy in the store. And fertilizers that you buy in the store, a lot of those are made chemically. They're made through, um, like in, in a big factory. They're not made from poop. Some of them though are. If you go to the gardening store, you can buy a bag of manure. And the bag is has sat for a long time, so it's not quite as smelly. Although it still is kind of smelly. Yeah, huh? you don't want to leave it in your car too long. <laughs> nope, you don't want to leave it in your car too long. But now here's the cool thing that a lot of people don't know. So Math Dad, do you think that the poop or the pee is the part that has the fertilizer? The part that's really good for plants that has the nitrogen, the potassium, and the phosphorus? What? Which, which one? Poop or pee? If you had to I'm, pick, I'm, if I was going to tell you. I think it's the poop. All right, so so here's, here's the, the quiz question, and I'm going to ask you in the chat to answer as well. So I'm going to tell you, I'm a farmer, I've got a field of crops, my crops need nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And then I can pick, I can either put poop as a fertilizer, or I can apply pea as a fertilizer. Those are my two choices. And if you're in YouTube, this is your chance to say poop and have it mean something and not be timed out by the mods, because the moderators are going to start, start timing you out if you're just saying poop over and over again. So tell me what you pick, poop or pea, say it real quick. And most people are saying poop, and you're wrong. You're really? wrong, math dad, you're wrong. So poop, let's talk about what it is and why it stinks, because I bet this is something you've wondered before. Why does poop smell bad? Poop is actually mostly bacteria and stuff that you can't digest. When you eat food, the food goes through your body, your body absorbs nutrients from the food, carbohydrates and proteins and minerals. It takes out the things that it can use and then stuff that it can't use is left over. But as it's going through and being digested, there are all these bacteria that are helping you digest your food. And when you get down to the lower intestines, you're down at the bottom, here's what your poop is made of. It's mostly water, but a lot of it, close to 25% of it is actually bacteria. There are so many bacteria inside you helping you digest your food. And a lot of those bacteria actually just get pooped out. So there's a lot of bacteria in poop. 
And there are certain gases that those bacteria make that have a bad smell. Things like sulfur containing gases that smell kind of like stinky eggs, that's, that's a product of the bacteria. So mostly poop is rich in carbon. There's a lot of carbon in poop, but there's not gonna be a really high amount of nitrogen, potassium, or phosphorus. So if you separated the two, if you separated the pee and the poop, the poop would actually not be very good fertilizer. It might have, it's gonna have some nitrogen, but it's not gonna have a lot. It's the pee that is actually the source of the nutrients. That's very surprising. Because your pee has a lot of urea. Anytime that you are digesting protein, you're breaking down protein, one of the byproducts is urea. And if you get too much urea in your bloodstream, that causes problems. And so your body, your kidneys take that urea and they put it into your pee. And the average person actually produces a lot of urine per year. And the amount of urea, the amount of just nitrogen that comes out in our pee is really pretty high. We're talking a couple kilograms a year of nitrogen that we produce. And that nitrogen it could be an excellent fertilizer for plants. But have you ever noticed that if you have a lawn in your front lawn and a dog comes and a dog pees on your lawn that you end up with a yellow spot where the grass is not growing? Uh huh. It's actually been over fertilized and over salted because this is the issue with urine. Urine has a lot of salt in it as well. And if you put too much salt on plants and if you give them too much nitrogen, then that can cause them to get kind of sick. It's an overdose of nitrogen. If you take pee and you water it down, like 10 parts water to one part pee, then it's actually a pretty good fertilizer. And there's some research happening right now to see if there is a way that we can separate the, the urine waste from the poo waste. And if we could do that, and we could just take the urine, it could actually be a really effective fertilizer. And I know that there are a couple, couple people who are probably listening to that thinking, oh, that's so gross. But here's the thing about urine. Poop, it's kind of natural that we have an aversion to poop because this helps us stay safe. Because poop is full of bacteria. And if someone is sick with a disease like cholera or polio or diphtheria, if someone is sick with one of those diseases and you come into contact with their poop, then you are going to get that same disease. You're going to get very sick. And so this is why we sort of naturally have this aversion where we don't like the smell of human waste and we don't want to be around it because over the centuries we have realized this stuff is actually kind of dangerous. If you are in contact with someone else's human waste, it can make you sick. If they're sick, you're going to get that same sickness. All right, quick question. Does urine smell bad because of bacteria? No. And here's the cool thing about urine. Urine is actually close to being sterile. Unless you are sick with kind of some really strange, weird disease, your urine is really clean because your kidneys inside your body where you don't, you can't have bacteria inside your kidneys. Otherwise you'd be like, you'd be septic. You'd have a fever and you'd be hospitalized. Your kidneys are filtering your blood and there are no bacteria in there. And it's just urea. It's that nitrogen containing compound and it's salts and other things that you want to get out of your bloodstream. And so when someone pees, the pee that comes out is actually pretty close to being sterile, being free of bacteria. It can be kind of contaminated by other things, you know, but it's, it's pretty close to being clean. So urine is actually fairly germ free. Poop on the other hand is not, poop is full of bacteria. Gotcha. Now, a couple, couple quick questions that I saw. Um, we are gonna talk about the cholera outbreak, which is a fascinating example. And it's really the first case of, it's like the birth of epidemiology, the study of human diseases and how they, how they spread. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but I did wanna answer a couple good questions that came in real quick. So one question is, why is poop brown? It often is brown, but the color can change a lot. And it's brown mostly because when, when poop comes out, it's not just bacteria that it contains. It also contains these dead cells from the inside of your intestinal tract. And those, those have that waste, and plus some of the other common waste that gets left in poop has a brownish color. But you've, you've probably noticed that depending on, on what you eat, the color of your poop can change. If you eat a whole bunch of beets, your poop is gonna be pink. If you eat a whole bunch of spinach or other green food, your poop can turn green. The color can vary a lot depending on what your diet is. 
And then we already answered, I saw a question about why does poop smell, which we all already kind of answered. Asparagus urine? Asparagus urine. We talked about that a little bit in a previous episode, but when you eat asparagus, there is a small sulfur containing compound called asparagic acid. And that compound breaks down into several very small compounds that all contain sulfur. And they're very aromatic. That means that they are small molecules that can travel up into the air very easily and be airborne. And so we can smell them very well, but some people can smell this compound and some people can't. It depends on what receptors you have in your nose. All right, we've got a comment here. Oh, okay. nice. So my husband is telling me that I need to correct you on the septic tank. If you have the correct size tank for the right amount of people and it's being used a reasonable amount for those people, people. The, oh, the, and then we have to find find the next one. Yeah, I don't know, the next I don't know one. if we finished off here. But, um, my guess is it can last a lot longer or be closer to self-sustaining. Is that is that? Um, there are different systems of septic tanks, and I think there are some that are designed to be pumpless, designed to be ones that you don't have to pump out, where the waste can kind of like percolate into the ground. But it would depend on how it's built. The ones that one that my parents have and the ones that my sisters have, those are ones that have to be pumped out every few years. Huh. So it depends. But yeah, I'm curious if 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 you're able to finish that thought, let us know because I'm curious about that correction. All right, let's talk a little bit about alternatives to, because we talked about septic systems and we talked about um, porta potties and how those work. But what about, you know, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, what about back in our history? What did we do for plumbing? And this story is actually a super important thing to know because there is a case, a very famous case, of sewage in London back in the 1850s. And in the 1850s, there were not, we did not have indoor plumbing like we have now. Most people had chamber pots. And so if you lived like on a second or a third floor of, of a building, if you had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, there was no such thing as a toilet. You would have a pot in your room called a chamber pot and you would go to the bathroom in that pot. And then in the morning, there, there's a common, a common thing in history books about people tossing chamber pots out the windows, just like dumping it on the street. And actually in London, if you did that in the 1850s, you would get fined. You would be in trouble because poop smells bad. And London had a terrible issue with smell. You were not supposed to do that. You were supposed to go down to the basement and the basement of every house, most basements had a cesspit. And in the cesspit, you would just have this big pit of all the human waste and you would dump your chamber pot into that. Ew. But here's the issue with London in the 1850s. A lot of these cesspots, they had people who their job was to go and, you know, scoop out all of the waste and then transport it elsewhere. But it was expensive to pay someone to do that relatively, you know, if you were poorer. And the, the sewers that they had, because they did have some sewers in London, they were made of bricks and they leaked. And even with the, you know, if that wasn't enough of an issue, all, most of the sewers actually led to the River Thames. And so they were dumping raw sewage into the Thames. That was also the air horse-drawn carriages too, right? So I mean, Yes, so this is like before cars. Lots of manure in the streets just from, from these horses. And in 1856, there was a heat wave. And this period, you can look it up, it's actually called the Great Stench. And here is a comic um, from a, a magazine at the time. So this was copyright free, published back in the... Um, in the 1600s or 1800s, sorry, it's Father Thames introducing his children to the people of London. And one of them is cholera and one of them is diphtheria. And I forget oh. what the other one is. But a lot of the artwork of this period, I mean, the public outrage was pretty extreme because the city of London was starting to feel like it was just unlivable. The smell was so bad that people could hardly stand to be there. And here's another one, Monster Soup, saying, you know, commonly called Thames water. This is, you know, and I love the, the the wording here, being a correct representation of what you're what you drink when you're drinking water from the River Thames. And oh. this sort of lays the stage for you to understand what happened with the the pump. The, this is a famous case in epidemiology because there was an outbreak of cholera in the year 1835, I believe. And most of the outbreak was sort of like scattered throughout, you know, certain areas of the city had this bad outbreak of cholera. But then there was one particular case that was right around the Broad Street pump. And there's actually a little memorial in London 
um, still today, where they've got a little replica of the pump and a little plaque to Jon Snow, the scientist, who is considered to be the father of epidemiology because he realized that cholera was waterborne. And this was something that there was a lot of resistance to because at the time, everybody thought that diseases were caused by bad smells. There was this theory called miasma, and you can kind of understand where this came from, right? Because if you have a city like London, where there is sewage leaking out of cesspits and being occasionally thrown out of windows if they think no one's looking and they don't want to walk down to the cesspit, I mean, the smell was just unbearable, and people are getting sick more living in the city. Whereas if you go out to the country where it doesn't smell quite as bad, people aren't getting sick as much. And so there was this theory that stinky air carried disease, and that's what made people sick. Well, that reminds me of our discussion the other day on uh, cause and effect. So, or the, just because things are correlated, they, they both, they're both they happening at the same time, doesn't mean one of them is causing the other yes. or vice versa, that there could be some other cause. But yeah, we, we've got to be really careful when we're trying to draw conclusions. So Jon Snow, he did two things that were just amazing. One of them was that he realized that there was a experiment going on in London because there were two water companies that would deliver water to people's houses. One of them took the water directly from the Thames. And he, he wrote in one of his descriptions that he was looking at a glass of water from this first company and you could see hairs floating in the water. I mean, the water was filthy dirty. And then another company took their water from higher upstream and they actually filtered it before they gave it to people. And the water companies, you know, who got what water was, people didn't even know sometimes which company was giving them water. But Jon Snow went and he tracked which people got their water from which company. And he found that the company that did not filter their water and took it straight from the river, that people were 14 times more likely to have cholera if they got their water from that company versus the one that filtered their water. And really, I mean, you can thank the whole like modern sanitation, germ theory, and like public health, a lot of it traces back to that year in London. And then the second famous thing goes back to that pump because this outbreak of cholera was so localized around the pump. And by doing interviews and by investigating, Jon Snow, he realized that it all traced back to a single baby that got sick with cholera and the cesspit where that family lived, where that baby had gotten sick with cholera, they had washed out the diapers into that cesspit and that cesspit had a leak that fed directly into the well. And mm -hmm. so the pump became contaminated with cholera and then everybody who drank water from that pump, almost everybody got sick with cholera within just a few days. They took the handle off the pump and then that, that is rather famously you know, correlated with stopping the disease outbreak because then people couldn't keep drinking that contaminated water. Well, that's really cool. I mean, back before they even knew what was causing the diseases, so they didn't know about germs then, well, right? Well, the germ, th germ theory was just, was just becoming a thing, but you had these two competing theories. Some scientists were saying, ah, cholera is caused by these little germs that live in water, and this was what Jon Snow believed. And then other people were saying, no, 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 clearly it's the smell. It's the stinky smells that carry the disease. And this was, this was a strong thing in favor of germ theory that proved him right. But there was also a lot of resistance because if dirty water was what caused disease, and if you could have a cholera outbreak just by having dirty water, then guess what this meant for London? They had a big they problem. They had a huge problem. And the River Thames, which was essentially one big open sewer at this point, needed to be cleaned up. And because that was such a kind of a terrifying thing, uh, there was quite a bit of resistance to Jon Snow's initial claims. People were saying, no, no, they didn't want to believe it was true because it meant too much work for them. Fortunately, reason prevailed and they did clean up the Thames and it is no longer have it no longer has sewage going into it. So Sarah's like, so technically this disease was a good thing. And you know, there's, there's something to be said. Anytime we learn from a bad experience and can prevent it in the future, I, I think, yeah. you know, we can, we, I guess when, when life is giving you lemons, you make lemonade out of it. And yeah, you, you can make something better out of a bad situation. And I'm, I'm sure glad. I, I hope we're learning something from our current situation so that the, the next time we're in a similar situation, we, we can handle it better. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is important to, to learn, from, learn from things like this. Now let's transition to talking about modern plumbing. So we talked about cesspits and outhouses and 
um, septic tanks, which is something that a lot of us have used. If you've ever gone camping or if you've been like at a place where, you know, they have temporary bathroom set up and you use a porta potty, that's one way of handling waste. And then the open sewer, which was what we had in London in the 1850s, is a very terrible way of handling waste that causes a lot of diseases, disease outbreaks to occur. But what do we do now? Well, now this is what most cities use. And where we live, we live just outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is what happens to our waste. It is separated just like in a septic tank where you have the sludge settle, all of the solid waste settles, and then the water goes through a treatment process so then it can be reclaimed. We live in the middle of the desert and if all of the water that we used, that we flushed down toilets and drains, you know, and when you shower too, that's wastewater. When you shower and you have that soapy water, that goes to the same place that the, that the poop and the waste from your toilet goes. And here's what happens. It's really, it's now when I, it can be, it can vary depending on what type of systems you have. And in fact, someone shared with me that Portland just put generators into their water septic system so that as the water is moving through, they're actually creating electricity, which I think is brilliant. <laughs> like you can have hydroelectric power tied to your wastewater treatment plan. Yay, Oregon. Nice. Now, what steps you have exactly is going to depend. There's quite a bit of variety, but essentially there are three main steps. First, you want to aerate the bacteria, all that wastewater. Whoops, wrong one. You want to add oxygen so that then the bacteria can eat up some of the nitrogen and the excess nutrients that are in that poop. Now, remember we said that the urine has the most nitrogen and when the sludge settles down and you, you're left with that wastewater, there's gonna be a lot of nitrogen in there because the nitrogen is the main source of that um, in, in the urine. And you need to have bacteria kind of eat that down because if you just dump nitrogen back into your water system, that's gonna create a huge problem. So that's step one. And then you need to filter it and disinfect it. And one time, have I ever told you about this math, Dad? Uh -huh. I took a tour of a water treatment facility when mm -hmm. I was in school. In, in Logan? Um, in, in Utah, in Provo. And when we were going through, they took us to the aeration tanks and it was this, it looked kind of like this, this frothy brownish water. You know, most of the poop and the solids had been taken out, but still it has kind of a brown color. And it was super frothy because they had all this air coming up because if the bacteria have oxygen, then they're gonna break down all of the waste from the nitrogen and do a better job of it. And the guy giving the tour said, make sure you stay on the walkway because if you fell in one of those tanks, you couldn't swim. There's so much air in it, it makes the mm. water so, the water is not thick like regular water in a swimming pool where you could float. There's so much air coming up through that you would actually just sink to the bottom and no matter how hard you tried to swim, you wouldn't be able to float. <laughs> and I was so horrified by that. Like I almost felt like I was gonna like collapse on the ground. I was like, oh, what a horrible way to die. Ah. <laughs> Now, after it's been aerated and all of the bacteria have eaten away some of that nitrogen and that phosphorus, then it goes through a filtration system. It gets filtered and it gets treated with chlorine being added to it to make sure that you kill any bacteria that might be left. And once it has passed certain tests to be sure that it is clean water, then it's put back into the water system. So in Las Vegas, our water actually comes back in through the Las Vegas wash and re-enters like meat. That's where our wastewater goes. Wait, so when you say it, it's put back into the water system, like there's pumping it into the pipes that are going back into my house? No, or? no, it goes okay, like okay, into, so. into an ocean, into a lake or into a river typically. And we call this effluent, this water that has been treated, wastewater and- Effluent. Effluent, E-F-F, -F, effluent. And depending on where you live and what the regulations are, there are different rules for what quality standards it has to meet. But in general, in, in, in developed countries, their standards are really strict and there are regular checks that are done to make sure that you don't have any bacteria from human waste that are contaminating the water supply because that's mm. important. Well, it makes sense. I mean, it's expensive to treat the water and to take care of things, but it's way more expensive to treat people when they get sick and all the problems yeah. that come with that. Yeah, the, the idea of getting a cholera outbreak is so it's awful. Oh. So yeah, it makes makes a lot of sense that you've got to be serious and follow those rules and regulations. Now, I don't want to take too much time because we have some other cool stuff happening, but I do want to point out something very important for everybody who is has ever used a toilet. 
is ever going to use a toilet or is ever going to purchase their own toilet and doesn't want it to break. So here is something really important to know. You should only put three things in a toilet. Any guesses what they are, Math Dad? Um, poop. Pee and toilet paper. Is there anything else you should put down a toilet? Um, no. No, no. Those are the only three things that should go into a toilet. And here is why. So I'm going to put a piece of toilet paper into this jar. And then Math Dad, I want you to, and the jar just has water in it. Okay. Screw on that lid. And then in this jar, I'm going to put a paper towel. And I cut the paper towel to be about the same size as the toilet paper. We're going to put it in here. Screw on the lid. And now, Math Dad, I want you to shake these jars. Wait, put them closer so they can see first. Okay, so those lids on tight. I don't want to yep. get the entire so we have laptop wet. Paper towel, toilet paper. And now, Math Dad is going to shake them up. And then here we have a wipe, a baby wipe. All right, now put them next to the screen again. Holy cow, the toilet paper, it looks like it pretty much dissolved. It's just like little flakes of paper. You can't even see that they, they're connected. But our paper towel is still pretty intact. Yep. Now let's do the wipe, give the wipe a good shake. Okay. It's a good workout, I'll tell you. Yesterday we spent two hours scrubbing our floor and I've never been so exhausted in my life. But our floor is a lot cleaner. Uh, okay, it's hard to see because the, <laughs> the, the baby wipe actually has some, some chemicals in it to help it to clean better. And so because of that, we get this nice layer of sods up, suds up here. But now that the water's clearing, the wipe is pretty much unchanged. If I were to pull out my paper towel and my baby wipe, they would look the same. They did not break down. But the toilet paper is completely dissolving. It's, it, it breaks down and it's designed to do that so that then it can go through the septic system and not cause issues. If you put wipes and paper towels into your toilet, you will end up with backed up pipes that no longer can let things go through and it can be really expensive to fix. Yep. So word to the wise there. That's, that's a good lesson because I, I think people who are guilty of flushing things down that probably shouldn't go. And oil is another big thing. If you put oil down, and this is this is for toilets or for your sinks, kitchen sinks, if you put oil down, that causes huge problems. Not just for cleaning the, the, the water at the end, but also for the pipes. Oil can solidify in pipes and it can actually ruin your pipes and you'll end up with a really expensive plumbing bill because then nothing will go down your drains and you'll have to come out and have someone come out and get it fixed. We've had that happen a few times. We did. They send but us a long sneak down. Okay, okay. Not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't put oil down our drains. It's the just like having 40 year old pipes in our house and having hard water. Yeah. And mineral deposits. Yeah. Tree roots grow down in the pipes. Yep. Uh, yeah, pl pl plumbing's a tough battle. All right. We will, I will answer just a couple other questions about. Um, what about, what about the Kleenex oh, tissues? Kleenex tissues? No. Kleenex tissues, if you think about it, Kleenex tissues are designed that, you know, you'll blow your nose and you'll have wet stuff going into them and you want them to really hold together. You don't want them to break apart. They are not designed to break apart in water. They're a little bit better than paper towels. Like they're not going to hold together quite as well as paper towels, but they still should not go down the toilet. And um, I should also mention something about Finding Nemo because I, lo <laughs> I love the movie Finding Nemo, but I have to say that every time I see it and they're like, you know, fish go down the drain to get to the ocean. I'm like, no, factually inaccurate misinformation. Don't tell kids that they can send fish to the ocean by putting them down the drains. It's not true. Um, you put things down the drain, they're gonna go through an intensive water treatment plant and there's no way that a fish could survive that. Yes, Pam not true. Pam wants to know, uh, why do dogs sometimes eat their poop? Ah, and is it dangerous to eat poop? Uh, I mean, we just talked about it. like so much bacteria. <laughs> now, there are certain animals, like we mentioned when we did our, our, our animal show, guinea pigs actually have two types of poop. The first type of poop that comes out has a lot of nutrients in it still. And the animal recognizes like, hey, this is actually not all the way digested. And it eats that first poop and just digests it again. And then the second time it poops, it has a different name. It looks totally different. And then it leaves that alone because all the nutrients are taken out. Now, dogs dogs are kind of funny and they will eat a lot of things that they shouldn't eat like socks um, why they eat poop 
or you know, sometimes they'll eat their own vomit if they throw up. I really don't know. I don't think it's a beneficial thing like it is with guinea pigs where they're actually getting more nutrients out of it. I think it's just kind of a mistake. That's my thought. They're bored. Yeah. They, we but, forgot to feed them. I don't know. But if you ever have a kid, if you if you are a parent and you have a little toddler or a baby that takes off their own diaper and then eats their poop, this is a fairly common thing. Um, the good thing is you don't have to worry. Eating your own poop, it can make you sick, but it's very unlikely to make you sick because those are bacteria that you already have in your system. And so although it smells bad and it's really gross, it's not going to make you sick. The thing, the health concern with poop is what happens if you come into contact with someone else's human waste. Because if someone else has cholera or polio or diphtheria or any one of a number of really bad diseases and then you come in contact with that bacteria, then you will get that bad disease too. Now, there is a quick little safety note I want to make before we go on to factor fiction. This is super important. I just saw yesterday a little article about how there's been a huge increase in poisonings and two thirds of the increases in accidental poisonings that are being called up to the poison center control or people are going to the hospital for, two thirds of them have to do with bleach. So math dad, any guesses what is going on? Why are we seeing such an increase in accidental poisonings and why do two thirds of them have to do with bleach? Well, we, there's currently the coronavirus is going around, and I think that people are like, "Oh, if it's good to clean my outside, maybe it'll clean my inside." Oh no! So it's it's actually not that, but that's terrible. Oh. Nobody should ever be putting cleaning supplies inside their body, but it's it is because of the coronavirus. So people are cleaning more often. And what do you think that they're they're doing with the bleach that they should not ever be doing? Cleaning their glasses, their cups. Mixing it with other cleaning chemicals. Oh. Yes. So here is a container of bleach, Math Dad, which is good for cleaning, right? It kills germs. Now, what would happen if I took vinegar, which is a mild acid and is also good for cleaning? Like if I want to get, you know, hard water deposits out of my dishwasher, this is great. What happens if I mix these two? So we have one good cleaning chemical and another good cleaning chemical. If we mix them together, what you do get we get? You get a super cleaning chemical. No, you get poison. If you mix um, vinegar and bleach together, you get enough chlorine gas, which is a poisonous substance. Chlorine in swimming pools in very small amounts kills bacteria, and that's great. But chlorine gas that you breathe into your body can actually make you really, really sick. It's poisonous. So if you mix these two together, you get chlorine gas, and that is poisonous. What about mixing bleach with ammonia? Even worse. Even worse. You get chlor chloranamine. And that is a compound that is so poisonous that just small amounts can actually kill people. So super important safety note, make sure that when you're experimenting, that you do a little bit of research first. And if you're, you know, say you wanna make slime, should you just substitute and be like, oh, I'll get super glue and make slime with super glue because I'm out of Elmer's glue. Is that a good idea? No. No, no. Make sure that you do a little bit of research before you just experiment and then with cleaning supplies, make sure to tell people that you know you should never mix bleach with other cleaning ingredients because it can be really dangerous. That's a good lesson. And now it's time for fact or fiction. All right, fact or fiction. True or false, science mom? Most people will spend a year on the toilet over their lifetime. A year on the toilet over their lifetime? I'm like, okay, man, I want to do the math real quick. So if you go to the bathroom like three times a day, and let's be really conservative and say you're a real fast bathroom goer, and you're only in there for like one minute each time. This is not very realistic. Okay. Three minutes a day. Now let's make it five. Five minutes a day. Okay, so, so 365 days a, a, year. a year. So we just make 300 times five is 1,500 minutes per I'm year. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to say true because that, that adds up to pretty quick. Okay, and I, I marked this one as true as well. And... <laughs> There's so much variety. Some people are spending longer than this, some are less, but it's actually, it would average just 18 minutes a day. 18 and, minutes and, a then, day. And then in an 80-year lifespan, you'd be spending a year in, on a toilet. So, yeah, that, that, that sounded very plausible to me. And I, I saw a bunch of different numbers. I saw as much as three years. I saw as much as little as three months. But yeah, so somewhere in between. This is a significant amount of time. It's probably less time than you spend watching TV, but it's... It's still plenty of time, and yeah, when you start hearing numbers like that, you're like, "Huh, I want to be better with the use of my time. I want to, I want to be, want to be <laughs> more productive. I don't want to." I'll just remind you: you spend a, about a third of your life asleep. Like, yeah, yeah, 
but sleep is important. It's really good for your brain and you feel better the two thirds of the time that you're awake if you get sleep. So that, that, that is true. All right. Well, nice well done. Science well. Okay. True or false? Toilet water drains counterclockwise in the Southern hemisphere and clockwise in the Northern hemisphere. Oh, I know this one because there's this awesome video that Justin Smarter Every Day and Veritasium, another YouTube channel did where you, and you can actually play like the videos synced because one of them was from Australia and one of them was in the Northern hemisphere. Okay. Here's the deal. <clears throat> There's a thing called the Cor Coriolis effect. <clears throat> Coriolis, and it has to do with the, yeah, the, so the, the Earth spinning. Hurricanes do spin counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere, and cyclones spin clockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And the Coriolis effect is a legitimate thing. But in toilets, it's actually not reliable. If you go and flush your own toilet 10 times, you, you might see differences depending on just like which way the jets are going, because there are minor minor movements and the direction of the jets is going to do more to determine which direction the toilet swirls than the Coriolis effect. Same thing with like you're draining a bathtub. If you go to drain a bathtub and you just give a little clockwise swirl before you pull the drain, it's going to go down clockwise. If you have a counterclockwise swirl, it's going to go down counterclockwise. So the, the only, only place I'd like push back there is sometimes the shape isn't symmetric. Like it's literally mm -hmm. shaped to favor a funneling of one direction or the other. And, and in that case, you can't control it. Yeah. So false that they spin different directions in different hemispheres, but true that in general, the Coriolis effect will cause clockwise rotation in the north and counterclockwise in the south. Or I said that backwards. You know what I meant. No. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think you actually said it right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's pr pretty darn cool that that effect even exists. <laughs> if you think about it, so the, the, around the equator, it's spinning, something's spinning a lot faster than if it's uh, higher up the, the east west spin there's less distance to travel yeah and so then, it's, it's all the rotation of the earth is what causes that which is pretty cool yeah. all right well done true or false more people in the world have access to mobile phones than to toilets oh wow so in a toilet we're like we're not calling F flushing toilets flushing toilets so like a, a pit you know or an outhouse doesn't count as a flushing toilet correct you know what mobile phones have like so many people have mobile phones now and in a lot of countries and a lot of third world countries mobile phones are like the first internet like people are getting mobile phones but they don't have computers or electricity even huh all right i'm i'm hoping kim says true the lion's den says true i'm going to say true this is true so in, in 2013 wow. the un did, did a study and yeah what they concluded was the about 4.5 billion people on Earth had access to flushing toilets, but about 6 billion had access to phones. To, to more people phone. have phones than toilets. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. So if, if does yeah. that make you feel more grateful for our toilet? It, it, it definitely does. And yeah, it makes me wonder. Like, okay, if you gave people the option, all right, for the rest of your life, you can you'll either have to use a pit toilet and and have a cell phone, or you have to have or you, you can, can have. have a, Indoor plumbing, Indoor plumbing, but no, but no cell phone. <laughs> and I, I'm curious what, what Wait, people would say. Let, let's ask the chat right now. Let's okay. ask our, our people who are watching live, because this is a really interesting question. And then Math Dad and I will tell you what we think. So your choices are phone, but you have to use a pit toilet, like a porta potty for the rest of your life. Or you get indoor plumbing, but you don't have a phone for the rest of your life. What would you pick? Say, so, so say toilet or phone? Yes, yeah, say phone if you want a phone. Say toilet if you want a toilet. All it, right. Yeah, that's... I'm yeah. saying Minor Master says go for the plumbing. Grace Gaming Wolf says phone and the pit <laughs> toilet. Shockwave says phone. Pixelbit8 says no phone. Jesse says plumbing. Suzanne says plumbing. Lori says toilet. So I'm it's we're we're pretty split. Science von Krista says toilet. She would give up her phone to have a flushing toilet. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Like, Science Mom loves to go camping. Oh, I just want a toilet. I don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> so. so what would you pick, Matt Dad? Ah, I'd probably go with the toilet. You know what? Most people are saying toilet. I'm kind of surprised. Because, um, yeah, for me, I'm like, oh, phone, no contest. Because, you know, using a pit toilet, or like, you know, it's not a big deal. It kind of smells bad, but who cares? And, but with the phone, you have, you know, the internet and contact with people and you a, a nice camera that you can have with you at all times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Fascinating. Yeah, to toilet, definitely one. No, yep. Go to team toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm team phone. <laughs> All right. True or false? Evidence of indoor plumbing has been found in Egyptian palaces dating back to 2500 BC. Ooh. Did I say palace? Egyptian. Oh, pyramid. I'm not sure what that was. Pyramid. 
Um, palace. You know, dating back to Egypt, we'll just say, right. uh, don't care if it's a palace or... <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say true. So I, I, I didn't look up and I don't know when the first indoor plumbing was, but I'm betting that it is ancient and I'm confident that it first happened with royalty. Because you see this in the Middle Ages as well. Castles actually had some primitive plumbing systems where, it, and really it was just like you were taking the cesspit and making a really long drop before you got to the cesspit so that then the, the royal people wouldn't have to deal with the smell. But that, that yeah, the first plumbing was definitely for the, the rulers and the wealthy people. I'm gonna say true. Okay, and this one's true. You're four for four today, Sans. Well. Yeah, you, you know your toilet stuff. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, so indeed. And they actually even used copper pipes. And I, I don't know if this was actually uh, waste plumbing. I think it might, might have just been bringing, bringing water, water in, in. in for whatever. But um, so th th these pyramids are actually starting to erode and decay, but these pipes are still there. So that I mean, co copper pipe lasts a long time. That kind of explains why we still use it today. How neat. I'm still seeing a lot of like conversation with people chiming in about either being team toilet or team cell phone. And I, I did see one person said, well, would you not be able to use a toilet in the winter time? And that that's... I'm glad you, someone asked that because mm. pit toilets are what people had for a long time, especially like in our history with American expansion, as people moved west and you had the pioneers coming out west and settling new areas, a pit toilet is what you would start out with. It took a while before, you know, the infrastructure ca up, caught up to have plumbing and you could use a pit toilet in the wintertime. It was just really cold. And that's why, that's the whole reason why people would wear long johns that would have the little flap in the back because it's so cold that in the winter time, you don't want to go out and you know, you're uncovering the smallest amount possible so you can do your business and then run back inside where it's warm. So you can, you can still use a pit toilet in the winter. Mm -hmm. It's just not very pleasant. Imagine going out at negative 40 degrees oh, in South cold. Dakota and there, you know, I don't need to, I really didn't need to. I just come, come running <laughs> run back, back in. in. <laughs> I'll wait till spring. <laughs> There is one other quick thing that I, I want to do before we go on to our math lesson. And this is, this is kind of exciting. This is a not super common occurrence. So I posted on Facebook and Instagram, I did a giveaway. These are all of the painting with a scientist um, paintings that I did, but I laminated them. So they're placemats, they're functional art. And then I said, comment and tell me your favorite small business, because this is something that people need to start thinking about. We're in unusual times right now with the pandemic and Amazon and Walmart, they're gonna be just fine. Those companies are gonna make it through totally fine. But small businesses operate on tighter margins. And my favorite thing about this giveaway was just seeing the variety of comments. I hope you'll kind of scroll down and find that Facebook post and just see how many incredible little communities we have being built around small businesses all across the US. I mean, people shared everything from like jewelry stores to restaurants to bookstores all sorts of different things. So what was the giveaway? So we're gonna pick the winner right now. Oh. You ready, Math Dad? What, what do they win? Oh, they win these um, these placemats that I made, which we, we all know are gonna be like serious, like collector art. Yeah, yeah, someday. yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what we have here is Julie Elifritz. Julie Elifritz. So I will message you, and if I don't hear back from you within 48 hours, then we'll pick another name, but hopefully Julie Elifritz will answer back and I will send you some art. Cool, cool. And now it's time for math. All right. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. Okay. Today, we're just going to talk briefly about modeling. And modeling, when we talk mathematics, Mathematicians talk about modeling. It's not like, ooh, let's pose, let's show off these clothes. No, it's about coming up with formulas and equations that can try to describe some phenomena. And we actually started out, the very first episode of Quarantine was a modeling problem. There, we started with this question, in, in Minecraft, you were gonna build a pool, but then around the pool, you were going to make a border. And around, sorry. These are, these are all squares, all the way around. And th this pool happens to measure n by n. And th so the, the question was, how many uh, tiles would we need, how many blocks to stick around this border to have a, a border for our pool? And it, what we did was we said we were going to let f of n 
be the number of tiles, uh, number of blocks that we would need. So f of n is the right answer to the question. So n was the side length of our square, and f of n was the actual answer. And what we learned was that f of n could be written, well, we said there were n along this side, n, n, n. So there were four n's plus four more. And that gave us the enough blocks to get all the way around the pool. This was a model. So th this equation right here. So anytime, it doesn't matter how big this pool is. If it's 100 by 100 or 1,000 by 1,000, I can find the right answer just by using this formula. So for example, when n is 100, if I made my pool 100 by 100, well, I would do 4 times 100 plus 4 more. That would be 404. That's the number of blocks that it would take to get around. So th this is an example of us coming up with a model. Not all models are going to be perfect like this. So when you're counting things, you actually might be able to get the exact correct formula. If you're trying to estimate something, well, in that case, yeah, the, the data might be all over the place. And in fact, we even saw a scatter plot. And what one possibility is we, we could take all the eight, we could take everybody and plot the ages of their parents so that maybe mom, dad, or Put put the coordinates here, and what we would see is some trend like this. But there's no one line that's going to hit all of those points, but there would definitely be an upward trend. So maybe some parents are younger, some parents are older, but typically age ages are fairly similar be between parents. N not a huge gap, although there's some exceptions there. But what mathematicians do is they try to come up with the best fitting model that they can. And in, in this case, I, I think a straight line probably would be fairly appropriate. And yeah, this line would be pretty much a 45 degree angle. Yeah, hard, hard to say. We, we'd need to come up with some actual data and check it. And it would depend on, on what the data was. So this is an example of us coming up with another model, and often we care about the graph. And I have one example here. So I'm actually going to get pretty fancy with this. So you're, I'm not counting on you guys being able to duplicate what I'm doing, but this is a problem that I do with my college students. So what you're seeing here in on this plot is the phases of the moon. So if you looked at the portion of the moon's surface which is visible, so on day zero, one. So 100% was visible. Day one, we start losing visibility. And over time, we get all the way down here, I don't know, around day 14, 15, it looks like almost none of the moon is visible. What do we call that, science model? The new moon. The new moon, that's right. And there's a new moon this Friday, and when there's a new moon, that's a really good time to go stargazing. Oh, yes. Because you can see the stars better, because there's less light. That's right. Oh, man, she's probably plotting camping. <laughs> I'm I, totally plotting a camping. All right. But then, yeah, as, as we continue on, we get all the way up to where we get a full moon again. So we started the full moon, had the new moon, and in between we had the other pieces. Now, if we wanted to come up with a model, we would need to find an equation of that. And a straight line isn't going to cut it. So I just want to show you something here. So this is a cool feature that Desmos has. So y1 is going to be a prox. So my, my columns here were x1 and y1. You, you, you don't have to duplicate this at home. a plus b times cosine of c x1. Ah, and what I'm seeing there is this purple curve just appeared and it goes Maybe not perfectly through all those points, but pretty wow. darn close to perfectly. And I can actually figure out what my A, B, and C were from my equation. So I'm, I'm using some trigonometry here. This is stuff that's w way beyond what we would talk about <laughs> in our quarantine. But that's an example of coming up with a model. And yeah, so as you continue on in math, you learn more about these functions. You know which functions to use when, and you're able to come up with actual models. So that was pretty cool. All right. Stop that little button there.
the stop button. Okay, so then today's problem, today's math mystery is I'm asking you guys to come up with a model. And here's the question. So you, if you had toothpicks, you could make squares. And in particular, so if you wanted to make one square, you would need to use four toothpicks. If you wanted to make two squares, oh, well, then you would need, looks like, seven toothpicks. All right, now what if I wanted to make a row of squares? How many toothpicks would you need? How many toothpicks would we need to be able to come up with an entire row of squares? So in, in particular, so my, my first question, what if, what if we just had seven squares? Let me see if we can answer that. But then, if there are n squares, so how many toothpicks to make a row of n squares? So that, that's the first model that I want you guys to try to come up with. And I I actually think you can do it. I think you can come up with the correct answer, but it will take some experimentation and you'll have to, have to play with this a little bit. And then we're gonna change the question and say, all right, what if I'm allowed to use two rows? So in that case, here would be seven squares. So I mean, how many toothpicks do we need for seven squares in two rows? And then in general, so come up with a model if I had N, squares using two rows, how many toothpicks would it take? Hmm. So That's the, a fun math mystery, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, now, I, I'm, I totally think you guys can do this. Uh, this the second one's actually going to be a little harder. It's gonna, your answer is going to change depending on whether n is even or odd. So you, you just have to, to deal with those two cases separately. Now, before you do the answer to the math mystery for yesterday, I want to remind people about what our engineering challenges are. So each time we have an engineering challenge and an art prompt, and yesterday's art prompt was to do dot art, which was really fun. That one's done with melted crayons. Got the crayons hot and did the art, and beautiful scene here from Ember. Yeah. And then our engineering challenge yesterday was to make a pulley. And I love some of the ingenuity we say, a, a rolling, rolling pin. pin. <laughs> yeah, with a rolling pin between two chairs, you can totally make a pulley. Now our art prompt and our engineering challenge today are a lot of fun. The art prompt is to create paper towel art. Color on a paper towel with washable markers, and then you have two choices. You can spray it or you can dip it in water, and the colors will change. And then our engineering challenge is to make a heron's fountain. And I'll just give you a little, little spoiler alert. Our heron's fountain did not work. Do you want to grab it, Math Dad, and we'll show yeah. them real quick? Yeah, it was kind of sad. Sometimes when you try something the first time, it works, and sometimes it doesn't. This is just part of life, part of science. We were really excited to make this Heron's Fountain. This was our first attempt at making it, and it didn't work. Why, why didn't it work? Okay, so one of two things, or maybe both, happened. I think I kind of melted through one of the straws using the hot glue, hot, gun. Hot glue gun. But I, I, I think it kind of distorted my cap here, so it's, it doesn't screw on tightly. It's actually leaking. And if the air is leaking out, then I'm not going to be able to get a siphon going. You, so you'll have to, to appreciate how cool the Heron's Fountain is, you'll have to just look up Heron's Fountain and pull up some other videos because it'll actually run almost like a perpetual motion machine would. It will run and run for quite a while and it's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, it's not really like a perpetual motion, but it's just really cool to see what, what the effect is. Yeah. So I was, I was kind of bummed when the, the, it would run for like three or four seconds and then it's done. Like, oh. So if you get your hair and fountain to work really well, you can be like, woohoo, better than math, dad, and science, mom. <laughs> and we'll be so proud of you. That's right. Now for the art prompt, you'll hold that real quick for me, math, dad. Huh? For the art prompt, I wanted to show you an example just for fun. So I did a little drawing that says, beware the pit of stench. And then if I dip this lower part into the water, something really cool happens. You can see that the water starts to travel up the paper towel because of capillary action. And as it travels up, we'll hold it here for just a second longer till it gets to the colors. When it gets to the Sharpie marker, nothing is gonna change. But when it gets to the washable markers, we start to get some really cool colors happening. And you can see them starting right now. And now our pit of stench, our pit of stench 
looks very stenchy because <laughs> <laughs> because the color has changed. But the Sharpie marker, which I used over here, is not going to change because it's not soluble in water. It doesn't dissolve in water, but the washable markers do. Ah. So, so there's you know one option you can do like color chromatography, where you draw a line with black ink and then you see the colors separate out as the water goes up. So you did that experiment once where you got every black marker in the entire house and yeah. then wanted to see, all right, which one of these are water soluble and which ones are not. Are not and you can, you can experiment that way. Or um, doing, doing a spray bottle and just spraying over and seeing the effect change is a lot of fun too. Okay, so the math mystery from last time, what we had going were, were three consecutive, sorry, simultaneous clocks. We had a 12 hour clock, a 10 hour clock, an eight hour clock and the question was, how long would it take for them to all be pointing in the same direction again? Well, one observation I would give you is the only way that a 12-hour clock could be pointing up is if it's a, the number of hours is a multiple of 12. Similarly, for a 10-hour clock, we need a multiple of 10 hours. For eight, we need a multiple of eight hours. So what we need is a common multiple, something that's a multiple of both 12, 10, and eight, and we act, we have a fancy name for this in math. The least common multiple is the, the smallest of these numbers, smallest positive number that is a multiple of all three. So in this case, what is the least common multiple of 12, 10, and eight? The least common multiple of 12, 10, and eight should be 120. It'll take 120 hours for all three of these clocks to be pointing up again. And the same trick would actually work if we were using any three numbers. So M, N, P, we would just take their least common multiple. And in fact, this thing would be true if there were two clocks or four clocks or a hundred clocks, we would always just want to take the least common multiple of the number of hours that each clock uses. That's really cool. I got to say the last three math mysteries, I remember learning about factors when I was in um, elementary school and being like, ah, who cares about factors? But now I'm like, whoa, those are really powerful. Oh, yes, they are. Yes, indeed. That is pretty cool. Are you ready for our, fa oh, not factor fiction, what's in the bag? I am um, ready for what's in the bag. Our riddle here? Although, hold on. I'm going to try sharing the screen real fast again and going back because our chat has frozen. And how am I going to do the what's in the bag if I can't have <laughs> people <laughs> giving me giving me hints? So real fast, I'm going to share with you, and there is a link on Facebook. We are going to end quarantine after next Wednesday. We are going to have a game show where we are going to run like an interactive, you know, answer the questions, kind of like, you know, Jeopardy style game show. It's going to be really fun, but we need you to submit questions. And we have about 15 so far. We need lots more than 15. So think back to your favorite thing that you learned and write a question for it and submit it. Submit right. it there. All right. Chat's still frozen. I'm on my own. All right, says mom. I build up castles. I tear down mountains. I build up castles. I tear down mountains. All right, give me another one. I make some men blind. I help others to see. What am I? <gasps> okay, so build up castles and tear down mountains. Like erosion tears down mountains. And you can make a castle out of sand. And then here's the one that really got me. Because if you get eyes in, like sand in your eyes, that hurts, I guess, in theory, that can make you blind. But help some see my lenses of my glasses are essentially made out of the same thing as sand. Because sand is made out of silica and glass is made out of silica as well. That's a really cool riddle. I love it. The answer is sand. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, well done, sand. If, if you were to tell me the answer was not sand, I was going to be all ready to go to bat for sand and say, like, <laughs> it's the best answer. No, that, 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 that's right. So, well, well gosh, you, you answered those questions right today. I did. You're on, on fire, girl. You know, I, I, I think I had to be on fire today during our show to make up for all of the mishaps that happened with our pin. I'm going to I'm going to say just a little bit real quick because we sent out pins, these little enamel pins to our enamel pin club patrons. And from start to finish, there were so many funny little things that went wrong with getting these pins ready. They turned out cute. Don't you agree? So there's one that says there's no planet B. There's one that says science mom squad. And then there are little quotes on the back of the card. The earth is what we all have in common. I went to the post office and I was all set like, OK, I'm sending these as parcels. And then the postal worker was like, oh, no, no, they are flexible and they are all flat. You can send them as envelopes and it only costs half as much. And she was so confident and, you know, not to like throw the postal worker under the bus, but 
maybe it's kind of her job to know the answer to that question. yeah so and i just i would just had one of them come back you know say return to sender because there's postage due and then i heard from another patron that they got a notice that they have to go to the post office and pay three bucks to pick up a package because there's postage due i'm so embarrassed you guys <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> well, so the good news is we are learning from our mistakes and next month's pin which is this cute little rainbow that says water plus light equals refraction um we we now know what we're doing and we're going to be better going forward that's right yes all right so i, I learned a lot about sanitation today and uh yeah what, what happens to my, my poop so th thanks science mom <laughs> you're welcome it's a fascinating topic wait wait before you end it I want to show them how this is developing because it's really fun to see the way that the color change. This looked like it was just black and brown beforehand, but now it's separating into all these different colors. And then you can't end without the art showcase. <gasps> I know we're, we're going a little bit longer than an hour, but it is time to share the art showcase. All right. Because we had some fantastic submissions come in and MathDad has not seen any of these yet. I'm excited to that share them true. with him. Oh, that's right. Oh, more pulleys? I'm gonna go back up to the okay. beginning and then make sure that our screen is nice and big. And now we're all set all to right. hit play. Oh, Noah. So this one was to do a watercolor painting and then sprinkle salt over it. And you can see wow. down by the river, like once you put the salt on and then let it dry, it really gives cool effects. So great job, Noah and Miriam. And then I, I can't quite read the name there. Haley, I think. Nice work. I love the little speckles. Like, doesn't it almost give it like it looks like a snow scene? Like there's snow, the way that the yeah, yeah. it dries. Interesting texture. Beautiful sort of just modern art. I love the pastels and the texture. Great job, Caroline. Alyssa. Oh, the flowers. Nice. I love salt paintings. They're so much fun. This makes me want to go and do it after we finish. It's been a long time since I've done a salt painting. Levi and his fishies. And the sea coral. I love it. <laughs> And beautiful rainbow. Nice work, Caroline. You can even see some of the salt there. Like it almost looks like a cloud. Yeah. yeah. Elena did a fish. Leia did this beautiful scene here. Nice work. Evan singing the song. <laughs> nice work, Graham. Love the texture and the colors. Vivian. Ooh. Butterfly. Beautiful work, Vivian. Sylvia, very nice salt effect. But yeah, these are so fun. I love the variety. Rashab. The birds in the boat. I love it. You never quite know how they're going to look because depending on how much salt you use and how much water, it can be different each time. Mm. Great job, Mark. Great work, Ivan. And lovely B. And then Janan Simon. and Simon. Yeah. Grace Gaming Wolf. Nice job. And now we've got some pulleys. So this one's made entirely from popsicle sticks and floss. Ah, Isn't that great? That's clever. So fantastic job with the recycle bin construction. Love it. And then here's one made out of Legos. Now that's nice. And then we've got one out that they built out in their play playground area. Very nice. And another Lego one here turned out really well. <laughs> so I got to say... Um, this has only happened one other time where our, our chat freezes, and I know from last time it's probably still working on YouTube and Facebook, but it's weird for us to end without seeing the chat because it sort of just feels, I don't know, it feels different. Yeah. Well, th thank you for tuning in, though, and yeah, I, I'm curious to see if you guys can come up with models for my toothpick square problem and the engineering challenge. So we had the engineering heron's challenge bottle. is to make a heron fountain, which, as you can see, is tricky because Math Dad and I weren't able to do ours. Our first attempt, our first prototype was a fail. And that happens sometimes with science. Sometimes your first prototype, your first effect effort does not work. That's just the way it goes. That's right. And what was the art prompt? The art prompt is to do um, paper towel art with markers. And you can do it chromatography style, where you see the picture change as the water travels up. Or you can do it where you color the whole entire thing and then just with a squirt bottle spray a little bit of water and it will make the colors mix together and be really cool effect pretty cool thanks for joining us and we will see you tomorrow oh and tomorrow there's going to be painting with a scientist that's right because yeah. on friday there is no painting with a scientist because i'm participating in a really cool um, event that patreon is hosting called the show up a huge a couple huge channels like um, braincraft are going to be on there as well with me and i'm super excited about it so i hope you'll join me for that on friday at 10 
And then Math Dad is doing some cool math art tomorrow at 9.15. So those are 9 15 Pacific. Pacific time. Yes, 11.15 if you're on the East Coast. 11.15 tomorrow, we'll have painting with a mathematician.